All right, friends, I'm here with Sean and Dr. Klopp, and we are going to be answering some of the questions that you guys had about FMT and the process. So Dr. Klopp was saying that he was gonna just introduce it for someone that is just becoming aware of what FMT is, the protocols, getting ready for it, and so forth. So um, we'll introduce John and Dr. Klopp to go ahead and give us the info. All right. So. Just a little bit about what FMT actually is. So if you want to know what it stands for, F fecal microbiota transplant. So throughout this, we'll talk just about FMT instead of repeating it over and over so that we don't uh, spend half of our time here repeating that long sentence. And it is really what it sounds like, uh, fecal and then microbiota and transplant. So what, what in essence it works like is, is that you have a very healthy screen donor, someone who's you know, vaginally born, breastfed, never been on antibiotics, eats a very clean diet, physically active, and um, you know, a lot of other variables that we look at, including their health history, their family's health history, and then from a screening standpoint, we want to look at their blood, we want to look at their stools, and we want to check frequently to make sure that they're not picking up any infections. So all of the blood screening for HIVs and syphilis and hepatitis and all of the viral things as well as their stools for all those things, H. pylori and any kind of overgrowth. So you need to make sure A, that the person's healthy, they've got a good medical history, and then validate that frequently because someone who is healthy can pick up infections and never know it because they're healthy and they have an immune system that can overcome it. But then when someone who's not healthy uh, would get that, they could have an issue. And so donor screening is, in my opinion, the most important uh, part of my role in making sure that this procedure is very safe and uh, effective. Now, so that we, screening's done before any transplant? Yes, so that's done on a regular basis to make sure that nothing new has uh, cropped up that could cause a problem uh, for a patient who's receiving it. So in essence, you know, we're taking this very screened, very healthy person's stool and it's not just the you know here's the stool we just throw it at someone who's a, a patient it actually goes through a very uh, sort of a cleaning process in the lab where we take off a lot of the fecal matter a lot of the fibrous material so that we're concentrating for bacteria because that's ultimately what we're after right the middle part of the name is microbiota when you're large intestine there's thousands and millions of bacteria in fact, we have in and on our body more bacteria than we do even human cells. So we're really run by our, our biome or the bacteria or the viruses and the fungus that are in us and on us more than even we are in many cases by our uh, cells. And so this is a really, really critical aspect. It's in our large intestine and many illnesses, including autism, include some damage to that microbiome. And that's another word that we'll often throw around is dysbiosis, which really means there's an imbalance in the microbiome. And so we try to reestablish the proper healthy balance by taking a patient, again, who's very screened, very healthy, we collect their stools, we process it rigorously in the lab to get it down to um, either an enema, capsules, or a liquid vial uh, that a child can take depending on their ability to swallow capsules or not. So that's the, in essence the, the process of how that's done. And um, you know, from a condition standpoint, a lot of people are familiar with C. difficile or Clostridium difficile. This is an infection that is still quite common. In fact, in the US every single year, about 30,000 patients die from C. difficile. It's often acquired in a hospital. And um, the standard treatment is vancomycin, but oftentimes that can fail. And so if a patient has failed antibiotics three times, they're allowed to do a treatment with FMT. Covered and, by insurance. Yes, and uh, with that, there's over a 90% cure rate with just one single treatment. So extremely effective, has a long history of, of being studied and in that very specific condition. And uh, you know, great results, greater than 90% cure rate. So it's phenomenal. So to break it down, there's a bunch of questions we got. Number one, a lot of people ask, can siblings donate? Well, I think he answered it in that presentation. Like, it goes through a, a heavy protocol to check the fecal matter to make sure that it doesn't have any uh, illnesses, any problems with it. So a sibling can't necessarily do that, right? And then you mentioned a C. difficile. That, uh, that's an illness that this FMT is offered in the U.S. Um, 
under insurance is covered. Correct. So why is this procedure not covered for other illnesses like autism? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that question. I just want to talk about the sibling one. In theory, I mean, you could use a sibling. The challenge though is, is that it's often, it's often hard to find if one child in the family has gut dysbiosis, it's more likely that another does as well. So that's one issue. Many people just don't know a healthy person who's healthy enough to be a really high quality donor. Mm -hmm. And the, having a high quality donor is the difference between success and failure. That is mm -hmm. absolutely critical. So that's one factor. The other factor though, that's perhaps as or more important is that we use the same donors over and over and over. So in effect, they're like road tested is the word that I, you know, I sort of like to use because we know that they're both effective and safe. And even you know, as good as a lot of testing is, no testing is perfect. And so the more that you can repeat testing and the more that you have a track record or a history of having used that donor, the more likely you are to, to feel more confident that it's going to go well, both from an outcome standpoint and that you're not going to see um, you know, some, some problem with something that you didn't think was an issue. So, so that's a big one. Um, and then to your question of you know, why is C. diff uh, allowed to be treated with FMT but not other conditions? That's a great question. If I was in power, I would probably change things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, but leading up to 2013, FMT was basically, we as in a healthcare profession, could use it for nearly anything we wanted to. There was like no restrictions on it. And then in 2013, FDA and other you know, regulatory bodies decided that they wanted to reclassify it as an investigational new drug. And as a part of that, they first said no to using it for anything. No, for even C. difficile. And there was a huge backlash in the community and um, the community said, no, absolutely, we need this for C. diff, it's so effective, greater than 90% cure rate, like how can you take that away from us? So they said, fine, you can use it for C. diff, not a problem. Um, and since 2013, nothing has really changed except for the fact that more studies are coming out on other conditions, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, they're starting to look at bipolar, um, some liver conditions. So there's a lot more research, both in animals and human uh, humans, as well as of course autism, that are very promising, that show again that it's not only uh, safe, but also effective. And I feel with time, the more that we can do bigger, larger studies um, and continue to demonstrate that it is both safe and effective, that it will eventually become approved, but it's a waiting game. Mm -hmm. So that's why it has to be done outside of the US. Correct. For right now. Yes, for any condition that is uh, not C. difficile, in effect, it's, you know, it's not permitted. And so we, you know, we come here to Mexico, which is where we are, uh, where it's not illegal to do FMT for a condition that's outside of C. difficile. What about in Canada? Is it illegal in also Canada? Correct. Very same mm -hmm. ruling as the United States, and it's similar in a lot of other, you know, sort of developed countries as well. It's the more underdeveloped countries that haven't taken a stance on it. So you have Arizona State University that's done some studies, but that's under a, a institute, a, a study, more of a educational environment, right? Yes, yeah, so you can apply for, um, you know, to do a clinical trial for any condition, and as long as you get approval, absolutely, you can go ahead and do it. There's even ways of that individuals can apply on, you know, with the help of a physician, apply to get approval to do it for a specific condition, but the paperwork takes forever and it's extremely costly and timely, time consuming. So, you know, for a lot of people, they don't want to go through that extensive you know, process with no guarantee that they'll be granted the opportunity to do it. And it needs to be, you know, the people that approve it need to feel that it's absolutely medically necessary. Yeah. So that's a, you know, a hurdle that may be hard to climb. So we're here, we've been here this week and just to understand the protocol and the process for FMT, it's not just, it's not two days of treatment. Prior to coming here, um, we received vancomycin uh, along with some other antibiotics. Can you talk about that process? Sure. Why? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there's this dysbiosis, right? This imbalance. And our goal is to restore the healthy balance of microbiota or the bacteria and, and the microbiome as a whole within the gut. However, we need to first clean the slate in effect. And so the way to do that is to use antibiotics and to use other antimicrobial agents to reduce the overgrowth of 
let's just say, you know, harmful or bad bacteria or bacteria that are not bad, but just are in very high amounts that can cause problems. So we're just sort of cleaning the slate, getting rid of as much of that overgrowth as possible so that when we transplant the healthy bacteria in, they've got a much higher chance of actually engrafting or becoming a part of uh, your new normal healthy microbiome. So if you weren't to do that, it's going to be a sort of a, a tougher hill to climb because there's a lot of bacteria there that you're trying to sort of fight for dominance in. So there's a question posed that there's some genetic mutations that a lot of times uh, people aren't allowed when they're taking uh, prebiotics, probiotics, genetic mutations don't allow for their gut to reset. This wouldn't apply for that, right? Because it's almost like you're you're resetting completely down to the core of your gut. Yeah, so there's a huge difference between uh, a probiotic or a prebiotic than there is to actual human bacteria. And so that's the value of FMT is, is that you're actually using a human bacteria that's not in some way foreign. So probiotics, uh, they do not engraft into the gut. They do not become a part of your gut microbiome. I've had many people reach out to me and say, you know, my child is low on lactobacillus as an example. We give 100 billion lactobacillus every single day and we've been changing the brands and it never goes up on any lab test. And that's because it will never go up on any lab test because it's just not something that engrafts. It doesn't become a part of your microbiome. It's not to say that it might not be useful. It's just that it doesn't become a part of your gut. And so it will go through, it will have some effect, it could be positive but then it just washes out. And so this is very different in that it is a part of a normal, healthy human microbiome. And so the body sees it as a, you know, a part of its, part of the system. And so it won't, you know, in the simplistic terms, it won't just kick it out. And so um, it is quite different. Now I have to look at, you know, what specifically the genetic mutation might be. Maybe there's some, you know, freak thing, but I really don't think that genetics has anything to do with whether or not there's an engraftment of this human healthy bacteria or not.